Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Go ahead and open your Bibles, Ephesians chapter 1. We're talking about the names of the Holy Spirit. Everybody say the names of the Holy Spirit. Everybody say the names of the Holy Spirit. All right, hallelujah. Ephesians chapter 1, we're talking about the, uh, the Spirit of Promise. Hallelujah. Look over here in Ephesians 1. Glory to God. There are 25 different names. We've already covered several. Amen. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13 says, In whom you trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom you, after you believed you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. And this is a reference to the fact that he is the great promise of the Father and the Son to us in this dispensation. He has been sent to us, the third person of the Godhead. Everybody say the Holy Spirit of promise has been sent. Hallelujah. Ephesians chapter 1. We see where he was sent on the day of Pentecost. Glory to God. Did I say Ephesians chapter 1? Acts chapter 1. Hallelujah. Y'all with me out there? Hallelujah. Acts chapter 1, verse um, 4. And being assembled together with them, commanded that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Not many days hence. Everybody say, thank God for the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Thank God for the Holy Ghost. So gee, the, the promise was that God would send the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2, verses 33. Acts 2, 33. Look down in there. Hallelujah. Uh, verse, I'm going to look at 32. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, which he shed forth this uh, uh, set forth this which ye now see and hear. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he himself, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit on my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Notice he sent who? The Holy Ghost. He was what? The Spirit of promise. He was promised and he came on the day of Pentecost as God said he would. He said he was, you know, Jesus told them to tarry in Jerusalem until they be endued with power from on high. After that, the Holy Ghost has come on you. Can you say glory? So he is the Spirit of Promise. Everybody say the spirit of promise. He was promised to us. Glory to God. The next name we have for the Holy Ghost. Look over in Romans chapter 1. So he was promised to us and he came. He's here. Everybody say he's here. here. Glory to God. We'll look at Romans 1. 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he promised afore by the prophets and the Holy Scriptures concerning his son Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead. The next thing for the Holy Spirit is the spirit of holiness. Holiness. This is not a reference to the fact that he is the Holy Spirit. It is a reference to the fact that he is the Spirit who imparts holiness. Everybody say imparts holiness. Glory to God. To the believer. The Holy Ghost, look at 1 Peter 1, 2. The Holy Ghost imparts holiness into the life of the believer. You cannot achieve holiness without the work of the Spirit. Somebody say, I cannot achieve holiness. Holiness without the work of the Spirit. Elect, 1 Peter 1, 2 says this. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace be multiplied unto you. Peace be multiplied unto you. Hallelujah. Amen. So here we have it that the Holy Ghost sanctifies us. He does the work of holiness in us. Everybody say the Holy Spirit is the one who works holiness in us. Hallelujah. See, it takes the work of the Spirit in our lives to get things done. We are not going to get them done without the work of the Spirit. We're just not going to get them done without the work of the Spirit. It takes the Holy Ghost working in us. They, everybody say, thank God for the Holy Ghost. I'm glad we got the Holy Ghost. I'm glad the Spirit works in us. I'm glad the Spirit is the one who works it. I, I can't be holy in my power. 
You can't be holy in your power. You can't accomplish holiness in your ability. It takes the Holy Ghost working in us. Everybody say the Holy Ghost working in us to accomplish holiness. So thank God we have the Holy Ghost who can work in us. I'm glad I don't have to do it. Now, this, I, I cooperate with him. I work with him. I do my part as far as studying the word and, and, and then listening to the spirit and being obedient to the spirit. But even in all that, I can't do it in my power. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Amen? One translation says, not by armies. Hallelujah. You know, not by power, but by thy spirit, says the Lord. To have holiness work in us is a working of the spirit and our cooperation with him to bring that to pass in our life. Amen? What's that? Living a life that honors the Lord. Living a life that represents Jesus. Living a life that we do things the way he wants it done. Living a life that we're, we're separated from the things of this world. Come, uh, come out from among the world. Touch not the unclean thing. Can you say amen? Amen. We don't want to be like the world. We're not to be like the world. Everybody say we're not to be like the world. Our lives are not to be governed and emulating the world. Remember Romans chapter 12 says, Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That you may prove what is that good, perfect, and acceptable will of God. The Holy Spirit's working in us. That he'll lead you to the word of God and show you things you should and shouldn't be doing. Amen. The Holy Ghost looks at your life and he tells you things you should and shouldn't be doing. That went over real big. But you still, still the truth. The truth is the truth is the truth. Okay. What, what, you, what should you be doing? You should be texting in church. Amen. You should be listening in church. Amen. I'm, I'm going to start putting a damper field in here that shuts down all cell phones. We need, we need the word of God. I'm just, I just threw that out there just to back, aggravate you. You know, I thank God for technology and stuff. But listen, we, we need to be tuned in to the Holy Ghost. He needs to be talking to us. We don't need to be distracted. We get so distracted with so many things. The world will distract you. The world will distract you with television. The world will distract you with sports. The world will distract you with this. It'll distract you with that. It'll try to pull you away so that he can't talk to you and say things to you. God wants to talk to you. The Holy Spirit wants to talk to you. The Holy Spirit wants to reveal things to you. The Holy Spirit wants to make it so that you know what's going on in, in, in his desire for your life. He wants you to be able to hear him say, no, that's not good for you. Don't go do it. Can you say amen? And that's his design and desire. He wants to be able to speak to you and, and create in you and work in you holiness in you. Praise the Lord. See, we get, we get to the point where we're not even listening to the Holy Ghost. He'll say, don't do this. And we'll go, oh, it's okay for me to do that. It's all right. Praise God, I can do this. And God's not into that. The Holy Spirit's trying to teach you. He wants to work holiness in your life. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. The next thing, well, I guess this goes along with the Spirit of Holiness. Look at Isaiah 4. Isaiah chapter 4. If I can find it myself, praise the Lord. Isaiah 4 is right before Isaiah 5. <laughs> Cats up here singing the, the Bible song. Verse 4, when the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and shall purge the blood of Jerusalem from the midst thereof by the Spirit of judgment and by the spirit of burning. Now remember that Jesus, that John the Baptist said of Jesus, he said, he that comes after me is mightier than I. He'll, not, he'll baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. fire. See, that spirit of burning, there's a spirit of burning. We'll, we'll get to that, one of that, that name here in a, in a little while. But here I'm looking at first, it's actually the next one, so we're going to kind of pick them up together here. The spirit of judgment. The Holy Spirit does work in our lives uh, to convict, convince, show us things that are sinful in our life. These people who come along and say that, you know, that God never talks, he just, because you're in the grace, he'll never talk to you about something, about, about sin. Yes, he does. Sin is a reproach. Sin separates you from God. Sin doesn't, sin is, a, is, a, is, is, um, is something in your life that will keep you out of where God wants you. Amen. I said, sin's not right for us. And the spirit of judgment will judge you on those things and say, that's wrong. Amen. 
Can y'all say amen? amen? The Spirit of God is the one who comes. And, and, and listen, if you don't listen to him, if you're going to be dumb, you're going to have to be tough. And if he's talking to you about things, you need to listen to the Spirit of judgment. He's judged that. He said that's, and when he judges that it's sinful, you need to listen to him. Well, I, I don't ever listen to that because that's condemnation. That's not condemnation to tell you something's wrong. We live in a world, I'm telling you, people are so crazy these days. You come along and say, you know, the Bible says this is wrong. You're mean. You're hateful. We're not to judge anybody. I'm not judging them. God's word, God's spirit's judging it. He's judged it as wrong. For me to say, when you say what God says about it, it's not, it's not mean and hateful. It's just actually, it's mean and hateful not to say what God says about it. Amen? Can I get a witness from the choir up here? <laughs> Amen. Saying what God says is not being judgmental. Saying what the word says is not being hateful. Saying what the word says is that saying what God's already had to say about it. But that people, you know, the, 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 the number one uh, scripture that's used by everybody to, to shut everybody else up because you can't say anything about what they're doing is the Bible says judge not. Go read the whole thing in context. It's, it's talking about judging unjust judgment. Amen. It's talking about unjust judgment. Judge not lest you be judged. In other words, if you're judging unjustly. And you go, and listen, there's all kinds of scriptures. We can go pull them all up, put them all together, and paint the, the proper picture about it. Just taking what Jesus said there and not taking the rest of everything else said about judgment is erroneous. The Spirit of God will judge you. He will judge actions and say that's wrong. He'll tell you that it's wrong. Amen. I said Amen. Glory to God. So we have to be um, walking with God. We have to be doing what God says, and we have to be doing it the way God says it. Can you say amen to all of that? Amen, 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 amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. All right. Now, so the spirit of judgment will judge us when we're doing things we shouldn't do. He convinces us. And look at John 16, 7 through 9. John 16. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away, for if I go no other way, the comforter will not come. And then the paraclete does. He is also the teacher, the advocate, the health of the strength, the standby. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to the Father, you see me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. Now, let me say something. There's a lot of people who've tried to teach that under the new covenant, there is no judgment, there is no consequences, there's nothing for doing wrong and for sinning. And the truth could, you could be further from the truth. He said he comes and judges uh, of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. That's Satan. Sin is of the dark kingdom of Satan. If you're sinning, you're working in the realm that's being judged. So judgment comes. That went over big. Now, God's made provision to get you out of that mess. It's called repentance, confession of sin, and repentance. When, you know, when I say confession of sin, I mean you go before the Father, and you, you confess you've done wrong, and ask Him to forgive you, you get cleansed of your sin. You don't have to go do penance. You don't have to go crawl down the steps. You don't have to do a whole bunch of stuff. He wants you to live according to his laws. And the Spirit of God will deal with you when you're living in, th in things that aren't pleasing to God. I said the Spirit of God will deal with you when you're doing things that aren't pleasing to God. Just like I deal with my, my family when they're doing things that aren't pleasing to me. Amen. I'm the daddy. I, I don't like that. Stop doing that. You know? And then God will judge us when we're doing things that aren't pleasing to him. By his spirit. If you're out living in sin, he's not just going to let you go do that. Why? Because it's destructive. And that thing that you're, deal, you're doing in life, are y'all here? Remember he says the spirit comes and the, he judges because the prince of this world is judged. When you're in sin, then you are connected to the prince of the world. And guess what happens? 
Judgment comes. So why does the Holy Spirit deal with you? Because he does not want destruction to come to your life. He does not want misery to come to your life. There is a way that seemeth right unto the man, but the end thereof is death or destruction, the Hebrew actually says. There is a destructive path that when you live according to the flesh and do what you want to do, destruction will come your way. God doesn't want you living that way. God tries to deal you with you by his spirit. He tries to warn you by his spirit. Why? To pull you out of that so you can walk in blessing. He doesn't want you walking in destruction. Why are you walking in destruction? He wants you walking in blessing. I say blessing. God wants you walking in the blessing. Not in destruction. So a spirit will judge you and say, that's wrong. That's condemnation. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. You can't take that one verse and make it a, and splat it all over the whole world and go, you know, and actually, and of course, the next part says, who walk not according to the flesh, but at, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And they say, well, that's not in the original Greek. Well, actually, if you go back and study it out, my brother, my sister, it is in the original Greek. We have two schools of thought. The late 1800s, the minuscules or the, the minor, minority text became the rule of the day. And everybody wanted to use that because there's a bunch of countries. Con, uh, contradiction between the minority text and the majority text. Up until 1880-something, the majority text was the accepted text for the Greek. And that's where the King James came from. Then they kept that new, that new, that new minority text, and there's, there's things in it that almost deny the deity of Jesus in the minority text. Okay? So I don't, I don't put a whole lot of credence in the minority text. All right? And so that part's not in there where it says, you know, that, uh, that there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. But you know what? If you go on down, in the, even in the minority text down in verse 4 of that chapter, it says, uh, who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. That's all one thought. Condemnation doesn't come to you when you're walking in the Spirit. But if you're walking in the flesh, condemnation will come to you. The Spirit of God will deal with you. Why? Because he's the spirit of judgment. He wants to keep you out of the realm where Satan is being judged. He doesn't want the, the, the curse of the world on you. He doesn't want condemnation coming on you. He doesn't want destruction coming on you. He wants you to walk in the spirit. He wants you to walk in the blessing. And so his spirit will deal with you and strive with you and work with you and say that's wrong. We've gotten this whole, we've gotten this whole new mindset that's infiltrated the church. It's a, it's a, it is a uh, communist, atheistic, uh, humanistic mindset that you can't ever tell somebody they've done wrong because you hurt them by telling them they've done wrong. That's evil. I said that is evil. We, we, kids get gold stars. They can't even use red ink pens anymore to say something and mark something wrong in schools in certain places. Some schools have passed this. They can't use red because it, 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 it signifies failure to the child. They're using purple so they can sing the Barney song. Come on, people. If you don't get it, you don't get it, and you need to do it. We pass people through school. 85% uh, of the students at our local community college that come out of the Guilford County school system, and that's not saying 85% of the schools, the graduates around Guilford County, but 85% of those who, go, who are in the school that go to that particular community college, 85% that came out of Guilford College had to take a remedial math or English because they did not get it in school. 85%. Why? Because we passed them, because we couldn't fail them, because they would feel bad about themselves. Well, how wonderful are they going to feel because they can't read and write when they get in the world, so they go to community college, and they got to do it all over again anyway. It's crazy. But that spirit has come into the church. And now we can't tell people, this is sinful. Why? Because you'll make them feel bad. You'll condemn them. And they'll, they won't come back to church. They'll go out, you know, they'll, they'll leave and go, they will go out and talk about how evil the church is. I can't help it. If it's sin, it's sin, it's sin, it's wrong. The Spirit of God deals with you about it being wrong. Why? Because sin will destroy you. And he wants to bring you into the blessing. And so he says, get rid of this with the spirit of holiness, with the spirit of judgment. He comes and says, get rid of this. So why? So you can walk in the blessing. The purpose of, of judgment is to get things out of your life. Why? So you can walk in the full blessing. You will not walk in the blessing when you're not walking according to God's laws. You cannot walk how you want to walk because the Bible's already said this in two places in the Old Testament. There is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is destruction. And then Isaiah, I believe chapter 55, you know, my ways are not your ways and my thoughts are not your thoughts, saith the Lord. 
What does this mean? That the, you know, when you come up with your crazy stuff, oh, God would never judge anybody. God would never condemn anybody. God just loves people. See, we come up with these stuff when the Bible has all kinds of other things to say. <clears throat> that's your ways. God says, come out from among them and touch not the unclean thing. That's what God says. Why? Because the unclean thing is destructive. Not because he doesn't want you to have fun. Not because he doesn't want you to experience wonderful things in life. It is because it is destructive. And there is a judgment and curse on it. And God doesn't want you touched by the curse. And God doesn't want you touched by judgment. He wants you to live in the blessing. So he says, come out from among them and be ye separate and touch not the unclean thing. The new mantra in the church is, go do whatever you want to do. God loves you. It's going to be good. But God says something different. And he sent his Holy Spirit, his precious Holy Spirit, why? To judge things in your life so that you can get them out of your life so that you can walk in the blessing. Because what does God want? You're walking in the blessing. God wants you walking in goodness and mercy. God wants to just pour his goodness and mercy all over you. Amen. It's not because he doesn't want you to have fun. It's because there is more fun in God than you'll ever have in the world. There's more blessing in God than you can ever get in the world. Hallelujah. Oh, man, the psalmist got to go and say, Surely, goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Man, can you imagine goodness and mercy showing up all the time? One guy said one time, he said, I got three angels. I got Shirley, I got goodness, and I got mercy. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. I guess you had to respell Shirley to S-H-I. Well, anyway. We get the wrong idea. God's judgment is not to keep you out of good things. Now remember this. Go back to the book of Genesis. And God told Eve and Adam and Eve, he said, I, I, you, you are, you're to dress and to keep the garden. He said, you may freely eat of every tree, of the fruit of every tree in the garden, only you will not eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Why? Because the knowledge of good and evil is not good. They all, God wanted them to know was good. Are you here? God, on, now Satan, go to Genesis 3. <clears throat> Actually Genesis, well Genesis 3, because this is where Satan comes in. Genesis 3. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God made. Now that had made. Let me say something here, folks. Satan is subtle. Satan is sneaky. Satan will trick you. Satan will convince you that everything is right, that, every, that all the Christians are wrong. All the old timers, they're just a bunch of fuddy duds. We got a new grip on. These young guys have got a grip on. Let me tell you, them young guys don't know their head from a hole in the ground. Unless they're preaching the full counsel of the Word of God, if they're preaching some of this dumb stuff, they don't know their head from a hole in the ground. And they're leading people astray. The serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field that God had made. And he said to the woman, Yay! Have God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Now, wait a second. That's not what God said. He said, Of every tree in the garden, you can eat freely there except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Go back over in Genesis 2. Look over here. Um, Verse 15, the Lord God took man, put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. What's that mean? He was to cultivate, to watch over, to take care of the garden. Okay? And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thou shalt surely die, or in dying thou shalt die. Now stop there. Now what did God tell them they could eat? Everything but. What did Satan show up and say? Yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the tree, uh, 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 fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God that said, ye shall not eat it. Neither. Now listen, she got, see, you start talking to the devil, he'll get you confused. Did God say they weren't supposed to touch it? As a matter of fact, the previous verse says they were supposed to prune it and take care of it. Isn't that what it said? He had to dress it and keep it, the whole garden. He just told them not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Didn't say anything about not touching it. But now you get in a conversation with the devil, you'll get your facts confused. You'll get your scriptures mixed up. 
Somebody said recently on some kind of post somewhere, they said, you know, you know, thou shalt, I don't know how this got on my post. The Bible clearly says thou shalt not judge. And I started to write, I didn't, but I started to write back. You do err not knowing the scriptures. Because there's so much in there about other things. You, you don't know the scriptures. Paul, uh, Peter said uh, to Paul, he said, people take that and they rest the scriptures. W-R-E-S-T, which means twist. Because Paul has many things that are hard to understand. And people who are unlearned, it says this, people who are unlearned do rest the scriptures. I am telling you, there's a bunch of people running around quoting, thou shalt not judge, who are resting the scripture. Because there's a lot of other scriptures about judging things. It's talk, that's simply talking about an unjust judgment, judging things unjustly. Well, I'm going to tell you right now, I know she's the such and such. That's unjust judgment. They're out committing, you know, they're out shooting people in the head. They're a murderer. Well, that's not a, that's not, you know, that's not a unjust judgment. They're just shooting people in the head. They're murdering. You're not judging them. The Bible judges their actions. You know, but you just look at somebody and make some statement that you have no basis of, of whatever on, and you just say that's an unjust judgment. That's what you're not supposed to do. You're not to unjustly judge, or you're going to be unjustly judged. Okay? Now, so she says here, we shall not uh, eat of it, uh, uh, short, uh, neither shall touch it, lest ye die. Now, she gets all, she's all confused now. The minute you give in and let Satan start having voice in your head, he'll get you confused about what God said. And you'll start believing that God said things God didn't say. I said, you'll start believing God things that, that you'll, you'll start hearing voices. The Spirit told me this, and the Spirit told me that. He never said. Why? Because it doesn't line up with the Bible. I said, it doesn't line up with the Bible. God, you can't even find it where God said. How many people grew up believing that the Lord helps those who help themselves? That's how I grew I believe that like that was gospel. It ain't in the Bible. But I've heard it preached. I've heard it quoted. I've heard it stated over and over and over again. Like it was, the, I mean, and I did find it one day over in the book of First Opinions. That's one of those apocryphy books. Okay? One of the hidden books, not even in there. She said, we're not supposed to touch it, eat it or touch it, and we're dying. The serpent, listen to the serpent. Listen to the serpent. You will not die. What did he say? You shall not die. Back up at chapter 2, verse um, 17. But of the tree of the knowledge of the good and evil, thou shalt not eat thereof, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. What did Satan say? Ye shall not die. God said, you eat it, you shall surely die, or in dying, you shall die, die spiritually, and ultimately you'll die physically. That's, what, that's the Hebrew implication there. And Satan comes right back, gets her confused. She's gone from not eating it and to not touching it. Satan said, you're not supposed to eat anything. Yeah, we can eat everything, we just can't eat that one. We can't even touch it because we'll die. Yet God told them to dress and keep the garden. Now he says here, he says, you know, uh, the serpent said to the woman, ye shall not surely die. Listen to this. Not only does he challenge the authority of God's word, now he challenges the integrity of God. Next verse. For God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall uh, um, be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Let me ask you all something. Are they not already as gods? God created in his likeness and in his image after his kind. They are the under rulers of the world. He gave them authority to, to, uh, to subdue the earth. They had dominion over the earth. They are gods. Now, you understand they're not God. He's made them under rule. He made them in their, his class. He made them to rule as a, as, a, as a god over the earth. As a matter of fact, when Satan lost his authority, 2 Corinthians then refers to Satan as the god of this world. How, How did he become that? Adam and Eve gave him that right. He says that God lied, and then God lied because he had an ulterior motive. Isn't that what it says here? God does know in the day you eat there, then your eyes will be opened. And you shall be as gods, knowing both good and evil. Again, I relay this. The knowledge of good and evil is not good. God doesn't want you to experience evil. God doesn't want you knowing any evil. The Bible says that the things that people do in darkness are, 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 should not even be seen by us. 
Well, I got to know how to minister to people. You minister to people by the witness of the Holy Ghost. You minister to people by the anointing of the Holy Ghost. You minister to people as the Spirit of God gives you things to say. You don't have to know what they're doing in their deep, darkest, perverted things of life to be able to minister to people. Because that knowledge will get in your head. Are you here? That knowledge will get, that thoughts will get in your head. The Satan will use it against you. Somebody say, yeah, well, that's right. All right. And the woman saw the tree was good for food, lust to the flesh. That it was pleasant to the eyes, the lust of the eyes. And take, uh, took the fruit, uh, I'm sorry, and desire to make one wise, the pride of life. She took the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband, who was on the other side of the garden fishing. He didn't know what was going on. Amen. Now gave her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Let me say something here, folks. How many of you have ever heard these people say, well, you know, these nudist colonies, we're just being like Adam and Eve in the garden. No, you're not. How do you know? Because you're not clothed in the glory of God. And the minute the glory went out of them, within they died spiritually, they, went and they knew they were naked. They knew it wasn't right. They went and found something to cover themselves. Immediately they covered themselves. Because they knew it wasn't right to walk around that way. The only reason they didn't do it before was they were clothed in the glory. They were light beings. They were you know, so much so that it emanated out of them and they were covered in the glory of God. What are you talking about? Moses came down on the mountain. They had to put a veil over his face because he just got in the presence of God and they had to cover his face so they couldn't even look on it. Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration opened up and let that glory out for just a minute and it changed the color of his clothes to white glistening clothes. That glory came out. Adam and Eve were created that way. No sin in the world. That's how they were covered. But when they died spiritually, when they committed high treason against God, and they died spiritually, the light went out. They became children of darkness. Remember the Bible calls about that we were translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. When you die spirit, when you're spiritually dead, people are in the kingdom of darkness. There's no light coming out of their spirit being. They are spiritually dead men. The light's not there. It's absent of light. Hello? Their spirit is absent of the light. So, you know, they're not luminous beings, as Yoda says. We're not this crude, but they're luminous beings, are we? Not unless you're born again. If you're not born again, you're not luminous. Y'all here, you're going home. Well, three of you are here. Two of you went home. Somebody didn't show up. All right, praise the Lord. No. They, they, so they, Satan challenges that, and they bought into it, and then by the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes of the power of life, they fell into darkness. The Spirit of God comes to you to show you the light. In the spirit of judgment, Satan wants to keep you in darkness and keep you doing things and saying things that God didn't say and denying things that God did say. And if you can't find out that God said something that you're not supposed to do, he says that God has an ulterior motive and you're not doing it. Doesn't want you to know something. Doesn't want you to experience and have all the fun you can have. Because, man, I'm telling you, man, if you eat this, you, you'll be like him. And you, They were already like him. Satan wanted them to be like him. And become flesh ruled and flesh dominated and governed by appetites that are that are um, um, well the Sith. I like the Sith. <laughs> Your flesh is like the Sith. You know, unnatural. <laughs> that many Jedi consider unnatural. Well, they're unnatural. It's not the way God created us to be. God created us to be like Him. Oh, glory be to God. I said, glory be to God. Hallelujah. Amen? So the, spirit, so, so the spirit of judgment, Jesus sent the Holy Ghost. Do not listen to people who tell you that the Spirit of God won't deal with you about sin. They're liars. I said they're liars. They've bought into something, and they bought into it for one or two reasons. One, they're deceived, or it's for the money. Because God's not showing them that. How do you know God's not showing you that? Because I just told you, God wants to judge and keep sin out of your life so that you'll walk in blessing and not cursing. He's not trying to hurt you. He's not trying, when he comes to deal with you about things that are wrong, he's not coming so that he'll hurt you. He's coming to keep you from getting hurt. Because whatever you got a hold of, if it gets, if it gets judged, when you're holding on to it, you're going, and let me tell you something, folks. If I grab a hold of Captain, he goes up and grabs 220, I get shocked. He goes home and grabs a hold of a bunch of 220 naked wire somewhere and puts his hands on it, and I'm holding on to him, I'm going to get cooked. You're holding on to sin, and judgment comes on it, you're going to get cooked. So the Spirit of God deals with you, not 
because he's trying to hurt you or condemn you. He's dealing with you to position you to be blessed and not cursed. To walk in fullness and not walk in lack. <clears throat> but Satan will come and use preachers or some so-called preachers. I'm not all of them are, are preachers. Some of them are so-called. They're emissaries of the devil. Some are deceived ministers who really are genuinely Christian, really are born again, but they're deceived. But God, Satan will use anything. You know, he used a snake. He used a serpent. He'll use anything he can use to speak into people's lives. He challenged the authority of God's word. He challenged the integrity of God's heart. And Eve paid the price. Adam, Eve paid the price because of it. Because they did not do what they were told to do. And that was to take dominion over and subdue the earth. Adam could have stepped there and said, stop. You're out of here. Now get out of here. This is over. This conversation is over. That would have been the end of it. Why well, didn't he? I don't know. Wish I did know. It would be great if we didn't know. Well, I actually wouldn't figure, it wouldn't change anything. The fact of the matter is we have to walk. And when the Spirit of God deals with us, when he's, he's talking to us, we can't override that voice of the Spirit. I said we cannot override the voice of the Spirit. Why? Because that voice is the voice of God. God has no ulterior motives. God knows that whatever he's dealing with you about is harmful and destructive to you in the end. May that be, may, listen, in dying thou shalt die. Now I'm going to tell you something. If Eve had gone clunk and she fell over dead, Adam would have never taken a bite. Are you here? If she went clunk and just, <clears throat> Eve, he just gonna met with God and said, hey, he's gone. Yeah, I know. I'll eat up your rib cage there, buddy. I'll take out, I'll make another one. <laughs> now, next time, stop it before it gets this far. But now he's went ahead and ate with her. Man, if she had fallen over physically dead right then, he probably would never done it. But he went and ate. They died spiritually. And then, 900 years later, he died. It took 900 years for Adam to die. Sin working in. It took 900 years. Because why? He was created perfect without sin. Are you here? Let's, let's pick up here on uh, the, that back. Uh, the other one was the spirit of judgment and the spirit of burning. His searching, refining, and illuminating and cleansing work. So in the, in the judgment, what the spirit of God is working at is to cleanse and to refine you. To cleanse and refine you. He's working to keep stuff out of your life. He's refining you to make you pure. He wants his glory flowing through your life. This is why I really have a real problem with drinking Christians. Now the Old Testament says, this, the Proverbs says this, wine is a mocker. And strong drink, I think folly. I think I may, may, may be wrong with that, but maybe strong drink is folly. Wine is a mocker. Coming out of Proverbs, wisdom. Wine's not good for you. Wine will mess you up. Well, I drink in moderation. Oh, give me a break. Yeah, and people who are watching you, what you do in moderation, they're going to do in excess. Hello? We have to be very, very careful about stuff. I do not believe the Spirit of God is running around trying to get everybody to say it's okay to drink. I just don't believe it. Why? Because by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, they wrote down that wine was, wine was a mocker. And the only place in, only place in the New Testament where uh, it's, it's something is said about doing it, it says to Timothy, no longer drink water, but a little wine, a little wine, for your stomach's sake, for your often infirmities, medicinal purposes only. Use the alcohol to kill the bacteria that's coming out of the water you're drinking. Had nothing to do with drinking for pleasure. It did not. Well, Jesus was a wine bibber. No, he wasn't. Well, Bible says here comes a wine bibber and a glutton. So that means it's okay to be a glutton. And the Bible teaches against gluttony all over the place. If you're given appetite, put a knife to your throat. They just said that about Jesus. He just said they said that about him. They were lying on him. Hello? See, people leave that part out. See, he was a wine. They called him a wine bibber. Jesus drank. It was okay for him to drink. Wait a second. He's also called a glutton. Does that mean it's all right to, to be a glutton? 
when the Bible teaches intemperance? No. So they were, they were just lying on him. Well, they said he drank wine. Listen, the Bible, the word for wine in the Old New Testament is, is the same word for grape juice and wine. Fermented and unfermented wine. It's the same word. There's not a distinction where we call it grape juice or we call it wine. It's the same word in the Greek. They don't have a distinguishing factor. It can refer to grape juice or it can refer, refer to fermented wine. Okay? Well, he turned the water into wine. He turned the water into grape juice. I mean, you can, you, we can have this argument all day long. But I got, old, I got scriptures that tell me that wine's a mocker. I got scriptures where Paul had to tell Timothy to drink some. Why? Because one of the things among the Gentiles was the Greek god of wine, uh, b b Bucca or something. Becca, Bucca. Huh? Bacchus. You know? The, the Greek god of wine. They just, they, listen, drinking, well, it's just part of their culture. It's been part of their culture for, for, for millenniums. Don't make it right. Well, that's what they do over there. That's part of their culture. Yeah, and Paul, had, I mean, they, and they were all doing it and doing it in, 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 in sexual perversion, and they were doing it in drinking and getting drunk. It was all part of their culture. But it, Paul, you know, they, they, Paul comes in and says, hey, they, they, say, they say abstain from the ways of the world that Paul had come back and said, look, you're having some stomach problems. Take a little bit. To, to kill the bacteria in the water. That's what he said. For your stomach's sake, for your often infirmities, they were, they, were, they were stomach issues he was having, and he took the wine to, a little bit, a little bit, as a purifier of the bacteria that would kill it. He did say little. He stipulated a little. Drink not only water, but a little. And then he gave the reason. He told them that. So that tells me that if they were all drinking and all thought was okay, he wouldn't have said a word about it. Timothy wouldn't have had stomach issues. Hello? If he'd been, if he'd been guzzling the way people, you know, you know, got churches advertising on their things. You know, we drink wine. Wait a second now. Why are you putting that out there? Because you want to look cool, you want to look worldly, but the spirit, of, the spirit of burning wants to cleanse us from all the worldliness. He wants to make us like Jesus. He doesn't want us living like the world lives. Well, I gotta get. I gotta look just like the world to win the world. Jesus didn't. He ate with publicans and sinners, and he ate with publicans and sinners as a rabbi. Go look at your scriptures. He's called Rabboni, teacher. He wore the garb of a of a, of a Jewish teacher. He didn't have prosperity. His clothes were so wealthy and so costly that the Roman soldiers cast lots to get him so they wouldn't tear him up and cut him in half because they wanted, they did, they wanted to tear it up because his, his, his sash was, it was fine woven material, one piece, wasn't even sewn together. It was all one piece woven together. And they cast lots to get it because it was so costly. Jesus didn't have any money. Okay, it'd be a break. He had a treasurer. How many here have treasurers? Okay. And you can't just have, at least, at least moderate, middle class, you know, prosperity wise. He was, and he was skimming off the top and they didn't know it. We get these crazy things. Are you here? The Spirit of God wants to deal with us about that. We, we're trying to come up with mantras. You know, we got we to be cool to win the world. No, you got to be anointed to win the world. You get the anointing on you and it won't matter what you're dressed like. You can come out like a bozo and they'll listen. Listen, listen when you go back and study Nikki Cruz, Nikki Cruz and um, James Wilkerson, David Wilkerson, David did not dress up like a street thug. Are you here? He did not go witness to Nikki Cruz as a street thug. He went as a preacher. <coughs> And he kept going after Nikki, and he kept going after Nikki. And finally, one day, Nikki pulled out a knife and said, I'm going, I said he said, what, what if I just take this knife and cut you into a thousand pieces? He said, Nikki, he said, each one of those pieces will be crying out, I love you, Nikki Cruz. And it broke him. But it wasn't because he was dressed like a street thug. It wasn't because he talked street talk. It was because he was anointed by the Holy Ghost with the love of God to minister the truth to him. And the truth of the matter is, you don't have to be like the world to win the world. You've got to be like Jesus and bring Jesus to the world so they can see the reality of Jesus Christ. Amen. I don't say you've got to do it suit and tie, but you don't have to act like the world and get like the world and be like the world to win the world. As a matter of fact, that's just, that's just a lot of times what ends up happening. Somebody just said this the other day. When's the last time you looked at a sportscaster on television, a newscaster, a news anchor, or whatever, dressed like a, uh, like a thug? 
Now think about it. Turn on ESPN. Is Charles Barkley sitting up there with his pants down below his back end? Hello? Is, is Shaq sitting up there like that? They're up there in suit, and I'm talking about most of them hand-tailored expensive suits. Fine suits and ties. Hello? They're not up there. They're representing something. They're not representing, you know, they're, they're, they're living a different way. The, the world knows that when, you, you know, you go to, I, I guarantee if you go to a corporate boardroom tomorrow morning anywhere in New York City, you ain't going to find a bunch of guys sitting in there in, in, in rainbows and cutoffs and down below their back end with their boxers showing. They're going to be sitting in their suit and ties, and they're going to be nice suits, and they're going to be nice stuff they have on. Why? Because they represent something. Yet we come to the church and we, we're, we're trying to be more and more like the world because we think it's going to win the world. There's not a thing that we can do and be like the world that's going to help win the world. We need to be anointed. We need to be like Jesus. Remember when they took the disciples and they, they, they threatened them and told them not to teach or preach anymore in that name. The one thing they did, they took note of them that they had been with Jesus. If we spent more time being with Jesus than we, tried, we were, did being like the world, We'd win more of the world. Hello. So God wants to burn out of us worldliness. I think all this is an excuse to be worldly under the guise of being a Christian. God wants to burn it out of us so we can be like Jesus. Because what people need is not you, not, not you disguising your Christianity under the guise you're going to somehow or another win somebody. They need you to be a revelation of Jesus. You're so much like him, they can't help but want to follow him. Amen. And the spirit of burning, he wants to burn everything out of you that doesn't represent Jesus. God said, be holy even as I am holy. Be imitators of God as dear children. Not imitate. Notice he did not say be imitators of the world. He said be imitators of God as dear children. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.